Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about radiation shielding part 2. So let's dive deep into it. Now here we are specifically focusing on neutron because alpha, beta, gamma is baby radiation. When we are talking about serious radiation, we have to talk about neutron. Now neutron are chargeless. That's the primary reason why alpha and beta shielding is so easy. They are powerful, but they are charged. So they interact with electron count quite easily. And gamma rays, while they are not charged, could say, but they are energy packet. Energy packet reacts with electron cloud. So they're a bit difficult to stop, but not impossible. Uh, while neutron is like chill bro, neutron man. I am not positive nor negative. I just go through things like just lol. So that's the fundamental problem with this puppy. And what is the mass of it? Well, it's one atomic mass unit, one AMU. Technically, it's a bit more heavier than a proton, but you get the point. Like this is a heavy puppy and uh, it does not care about your electron cloud. It just does not care. Now, however, while that is true that it does not care, it has an internal clock, so to say. So the moment a neutron leads the safety of uh, basically nucleus, it starts to create a basically down spiral and that down spiral is 887 seconds, meaning it, that puppy is only gonna last for 14 minutes, 47 seconds. After that, it's gonna change into other things like proton, electron, anti-neutrinos. Basically, it's gonna go and then change into other stuff. Now, be mindful, sometimes it could also uh, give off uh, gamma photons, but generally that rarely happens. Most of the time, it will be electron, anti-neutrinos and proton, which should, in principle, be more easier to stop. So that's the whole point. It's uh, life span outside of the nucleus is very, very limited. And uh, it only has collision with nucleus, meaning if it's going through stuff, what is stuff? Stuff is made out of atoms. What is atom made out of? Well, 99.99% empty space. That empty space is electron cloud. Only in the center of it, like you zoom the hell in, only in that place you find basically nucleus. The neutron can only interact with this nucleus. Now, uh, interaction could be in multiple ways. First, it could be just physical. It could just bam into it. It will not be absorbed or do any changes, but it will just knock it out or uh, it could get absorbed into it. So that's a more of a probabilistic calculation, not just like, okay, it's going to go here and it's going to do this. It does not work that way. You have to have cross sections and then probability and all that jazz. Because electron cloud flat out is like, nope, I don't even care. Electron shell, I don't even care. So that's neutron. So what are its sources? Well, first sources are obvious, fission. Uh, when you have nuclear fission and uranium just like can't get the, keep the marriage together and then it's just boom. And then it has two neutrons. These are very fast puppies, very dangerous puppies. And if you design a boom device, it, it will basically directly hit other boom boom device and then it goes kaboom device. So that's fission. Then you have fusion, you have deuterium and tritium. They are making love together. And in that love, they have one extra neutron. They are just like yeet that puppy out of it. And on the other side, the daughter is basically helium, uh, but that neutron is powerful. So that's nuclear fission and fusion. That's the primary source most of the time of neutron radiation. Then we come to accelerator based neutron sources. Uh, we can use particle accelerator to achieve neutron emission. It has uh, options, research, uh, medical research and all that, but it's not as easy as X-ray. So it's a bit more difficult, but it can be done. If we, humanity wants to create nuclear neutron radiation, we can create it without having boom boom. So that's the good part. Uh, however, the most rare part is neutron decay, meaning you have stuff that stuff is giving neutron. That's very rare. That's why most of the time, whenever you are talking about uh, basically nuclear waste or stuff, most of the time you are talking about basically alpha, beta, and gamma. You're not generally not talking about neutron decay. While it does happen, but it's very rare. For example, oxygen 17 has that, uh, helium 5 has that, beryllium 13 has that, or the actual real life useful source is californium 252. Now you're like, wait a minute, why the heck the name is California? Well, uh, it's man made and they ran out of gold names and all that stuff so they just put a state name and uh, this puppy gives out neutron now be mindful neutron is a very integral part of a nucleus so fundamentally it does not have lifespan its half-life is 2.6 years so we make them and then we just use it for neutron source for many things for example inspection of stuff you want to do quality inspection neutron is your guy so we use neutron for inspection and you'll be shocked like how many architecture has to be studied and scanned and stuffed by California. And to give you a context, if you go into Wikipedia, there is an image uh, early days to shield one gram. 
I repeat, one gram of californium, they had a 50 ton shielding container. 50 ton to one gram. Let that sink in. Now, neutrons have generally two categories. They are fast and they are slow. Slows are also called thermal neutrons. Uh, and if you watch Chernobyl, you must know this part. Like generally reactions create very fast uh, neutrons and uh, they will not react with dirty fuel. To make sure they react with dirty fuel, you have to slow them down using moderator. Uh, in a boom boom device, they generally design it such a way that this fast reactor can take place. And if they do the calculation wrong, uh, they will have a big oops uh, that happened when America first time tested hydrogen oops. And yes, it was oops because it exceeded the power capacity by 2.5x. Like the yield was so high because the oops happened. So that's the sources of it. Now here's the, the damage part of it. So when you're talking about alpha, beta and gamma, uh, they are problematic but not that bad. They're like, yeah, you can manage it. The moment you go to neutron, it is a completely different ball game because fundamentally it's nuclear reaction. Uh, so you have to understand if you are not doing it properly, you may start another reaction. So it changes things on fundamental level. Like you're going down to the atom, to the nucleus and you're changing that. So it's brutal. And when you're talking about uh, non chemical reaction it can still cause what you call physical displacement basically you have a stuff let's say tungsten you have a tungsten block awesome strong pure tungsten block uh, the neutron has so much oomph into it it can physically go in there and knock an atom out basically literally it can go inside a crystal lattice and be like hey go away it can do that like it is a, such a big brutal problem that we have a uh, measurement unit for that called as displacement per atom so uh, there is a number of that like if you are next to a nuclear reactor there is a uh, dpa and this dpa trust me it breaks down material on fundamental like it goes inside crystal lattice and bams it so it's extremely brutal and then we have that itself is physically bad uh, then we have neutron activation that is really really bad now this basically changes element on a fundamental level now elements have uh, two axes of changing it can go uh, into different elements or it can become isotope of the same element so these are the two axes elements have uh, to basically traverse so to say when you are making them uh, get in bed together with a neutron now neutron will generally give you two outcomes mix of these two outcomes will happen outcome number one is safe and stable basically you started with carbon and carbon was c12 and then you added one neutron into it the carbon is like okay i can handle this we'll we'll stay calm so carbon is carbon the structure is still carbon nothing changed it's stable it's non-radioactive and uh, you could have other things where it's safe but changed for example you can be going from let's say some variant to other thing it has become from let's say carbon to nitrogen other higher numbers uh, carbon to nitrogen is stable uh, basically in terms of radioactive it's not radioactive so it's safe but it has changed it's fundamentally not the same thing if you have a wire made out of carbon it will literally disintegrate because it ch changed into nitrogen gas so that's there then you have radioactive and stable for example you take nickel you put some neutron love into it so nickel 58 goes to nickel 59 super duper hyper radioactive this puppy cools down after 75,000 years if you ever watch people talking about like we're gonna make a battery that lasts for 10,000 years generally they are talking about nickel and then we have cobalt puppy now cobalt uh, starts with 59 and it can if you force a neutron into it it goes to cobalt 60 yeah that puppy is unstable and brutally unstable so but it will still annoy you for 5.27 years that's a long time to be annoyed by it and then you have copper source of all our electronics uh, that puppy goes from 63 to 64 and thankfully this puppy is a bit gentle so it only cooks you for 12.7 hours so let that sink in. There will only two options that will happen if neutron gets inside your atom. And those two options would be a mixture of safe and stable to safe and changed to radioactive and stable. Generally, this sort of mixture will happen. So be mindful, you cannot just put stuff around a neutron to stop it. You have to study this thing, what the hell is happening on an elemental level, on an atomic level, only then you can create a structure. And be mindful, changing stuff happens methodically also for example c12 to 13 everything is awesome but here's dlc 13 to c14 that's a radioactive so it's a completely different ball game when you're talking about nuclear physics this is what people study in nuclear physics what the hell neutron does like 99 percent of nuclear physics what the hell is neutron doing that's it that's it like if you want to understand nuclear physics understand what the hell neutron is doing
then we come to the shielding part of it. Well, uh, it's not a simple matter of blocking it because still, you have come off a race coming from somewhere. You apply uh, like instantly a thick amount of stuff like that has giant electron cloud. Uh, for example, lead, tungsten or uranium. Yes, it will work. And uh, everything is awesome. But here's the deal. When you are talking about this, yeah, that logic does not work anymore because you have to study the changes that will happen. Be mindful. If you have uranium, you could enrich it. So that's a very serious thing. You have to be very mindful which elements you have. Like for example, when NASA is designing their Orion space capsule, uh, they had to go through some serious rigorous testing because this is not Apollo era where you're just like yeet people there. They have to be like, dude, we are yeeting you there, but we know that you won't be affected by it. So in that case, they have to make sure every cosmic ray particle that is hitting the system, is it activating it? Is it re uh, forcing a neutron release? Is it doing so? If yes, then what's happening with that neutron? Many times it's uh, better from a health point of view that you have one high speed neutron going through you rather than multiple slower particles, but multiple of them going through you. So all of these sort of calculations have to be done. You cannot just like, I'm going to put stuff. That's not how it works. So very mindful, very, you, you have to study this thoroughly. And hydrogen, good, but it's not unaffected. What does that mean? That simply means you start with protonium. Protonium is just proton, electron, everything is fine, everything is dandy, normal water. But what if you force one neutron into it? Like, please get married. It's like, it gets married, it's like everything is fine, it's just heavy now, it's heavy water now. And uh, here's the deal, what if you're like, hey, what if you put threesome into it? You just force another thing. Now here's the problem, now it's tritium. Uh, that puppy is radioactive. So you see, like we started with hydrogen, that was like awesome, we good, we got this, to like, uh, that itself is the problem. Like let's say you have a spacecraft and you have a gas wall that is shielded by hydrogen. It's day one, awesome. But like day 100 of like, you know, deep space travel, it will be like, yeah, we have too much deuterium in it. Day 500, it will be like, yeah, we are starting to get tritium into it. So yes, it can be shielded, but you have to be mindful. Like it would be really bad if all of the hydrogen slowly over time, of course, long deep space mission turned into tritium. It would be hell of a hassle. So that's the whole thing. And when we come to water, water also is good, but it still suffers from this. And be mindful, oxygen also can turn into something naughty. So it's not a, oh, I'm gonna shield it with this. Do you have neutron flux? Oh yes, then you have to really be worried about it because again, this will happen if you have water issue. And once tritium becomes uh, basically water and bond, basically hydrogen that is mixed with oxygen, uh, it's nigh impossible to remove. Like it's not impossible, impossible. It's just like good luck. Like you can look into nuclear fusion plants. They have a giant detritium plant. They remove uh, basically tritium from it. So not easy. And very time, it's very hard to isolate. So, and be mindful, uh, tritium is not the final stop. Generally, it's the final stable stop. You can still force a, a neutron into it, and uh, you can go even higher than that. Basically, helium-4, you can go helium... Uh, Hydrogen 4, hydrogen 5, hydrogen 6, hydrogen 7. But these puppies only last for femtosecond. They are not even a second kind of thing. So generally, we do not count it as stable. So they do not have cool limbs. If you know the cool limbs, write them down below. So that's the whole point. Hydrogen, good, but does not mean it's like, don't worry about it. Now, heavy atoms, uh, let's say you put for shielding, it creates whole another issue. And this is a very big issue for, for let's say, deep space travel. Let's say you were like, hey, what if I put polythene? It's a really good because it has a lot of hydrogen, awesome. And let's say the mission is not long enough where, like, you know, that will happen, tritium will happen. And be mindful, tritium is radioactive, it's easy to stop. But you no longer have gamma shielding. Sun is putting some extra love into you, you'll be cooked. So that's a very serious issue. It's a difficult. So if you want to use a shielding material, you have to see what's happening with alpha, beta, gamma, and specifically neutron, because neutron creates uh, what you call particle shower. So you have to be very mindful what is happening with neutron. Otherwise, you could literally create a shield that is worse than if you did not have a shield. So that's the shielding part of it. That's like, yeah, that's how uh, people in nuclear industry earn their paycheck. They figure out what the hell neutron is doing. Then we come to fusion. Now, I have always said this very clear. Fusion is not happening anytime soon. And uh, it's not going to happen before the global warming problem is solved. Because if it's not solved, we cooked. And uh, this puppy is not happening anytime soon. The primary reason for that is cost. Let that be very clear. I'm not talking about science. I'm talking about cost. Now, how I can be so damn sure about cost? Well, first look at the history. Second, neutron. Uh, basically, Fusion makes fast neutrons. Well, that's normal. That's like a fission power plant. That's not a hassle, but it makes way too much of it. Like there is no tomorrow kind of it. For example, if you have fission, it's like, okay, I got this, I got this. But if you have same oomph out of it, uh, you're gonna get three X more. 
like a bonkersly large amount of I have linked the video from a nuclear physicist down below so you can check that out so be mindful it's brutal now how can we uh, you know chillax with uh, fission well simply because it's a liquid state stuff you have a reaction happening and you have water around it. What does water have? Hydrogen. What does water do? Absorb. And when you are talking about something that does not have crystal lattice structure, neutron just heats it up. And we want water to heat up so we can drive turbines. So everything is fine. Water is like a very good bridge medium. When you do not have the bridge medium, for example, a vacuum flask of a, you know, ITER reactor, uh, then you have the issue. It's like, how the heck are you going to stop neutron? You can't because there is no water in the chamber. And uh, what the hell are you going to do? Because magnetic field is not going to have an effect. What the hell are you going to do? So it's going to directly hit what we call first wall. That first wall will become this. This is from neutron. Like plasma is like heating it and neutron simply billiard balling it. It's like boing. Uh, atom will go boing here. Boing. Bang. Boing. It's like it destroys it on a microscopic level. So you won't even know. It's like why the heck my plasma is uh, like, you know, no longer heating up. You may be like these hairs, uh, fuzz would have grown so much that plasma is contact, uh, you know, continuously touching it and evaporating, losing energy. So that's an issue. And that's why. So you do not have the luxury of neutron. Water. Like, of course, outside of a shield, you have liquid water or some other things. For example, lithium blanket in order to absorb that. That's awesome. But here's still, what about the first wall? That's the big issue. First wall, the first thing that absorbs the neutron flux. Yeah, that's the issue. That's why I said, like, can fusion reactor be built? Maybe in 100 years. Could it be built cheaply enough? Hell no. Like, because neutron is one of those things. It's like, no. Just like everything else, like, yes. Neutron, no. So water, like, can you be done cheaply? Hell no. So everything over time becomes radioactive from hydrogen uh, in water to oxygen in water to tungsten to carbon, everything becomes radioactive. Uh, and this is another aspect. After building the plant, they figured out that you have fusion plasma, everything's fine. Uh, but uh, because be mindful, magnetic confinement, good and all, but there is no such thing as absolute confinement. So some particles just make love, basically tritium, penetrates through the material because we might feel it's at plasma level energy it's very hot uh, like the molecule is like going in it penetrates through it contaminates the coolant so that's another reason why they need uh, basically giant deuterium plant because not only neutron is activating which is a slow process not going to happen overnight but tritium is directly being produced and penetrating inside and contaminating the coolant system yeah you're not gonna do this cheaply so that's the whole point. Now, aim is with uh, this plants and all that government wise is that they're going to build it. They're going to use it. And at some point they have to decommission it. Be it 100 years from now or 1000 years from now. The aim is that once we decommission it, basically done, we good, we sorted. We're going to turn this puppy down, build a new or a better one. What happens to product like things that are inside? They will be idiotically radioactive. The aim is that after 100 years of storage, after turning off point, uh, it should go back to background radiation. It will be still be radioactive, but it should go back to background radiation. Uh, and I'm like, 100 years of storage. Who's paying for that? Like genuinely, th that's my whole point. That's why I hate nuclear. It's like, who's paying for that? It's like, oh, oh this is best. And it's like, who is paying for that? Other than adding bankruptcy level of money into national debt, it never works. It's like, oh, France has this. It's like, yeah, look into how much money they have to put into it. It's like solve one problem by creating 10 other problems and hope your future does not mess it up and hope you do not have a war. Uh, that's not a good, stable, long-term strategy. And this, many times I've seen people talking about this as like it has no radiation. It, it has more radiation than a fusion core. If you have a fusion core, you're like, okay, that's bad. This is like, no bro, this is hyper bad. What does that mean? That simply means any bolt, any minor issue inside that happens. Of course, it's a physical thing. It does break down. They have to have a robot go inside and do, fix it. And meanwhile, those robots are not normal robots. They have to design to work in extreme neutron environment. Circuits do not work. They have wired based system and radiation hardened hardware that like barely any hardware that works that well. So it's another hassle they have to figure out. And these are one of those things that once they actually build it, it's like, oh, this is not working. That's why the ear will keep getting pushed. Then they will build some other thing. It's like, we, we're gonna have this mirror and laser and it's like, oh, that did not work. Why? Neutron was like, no, bro. So that's the another reason of budget going just lol. So this is a critical aspect of it. It's like neutron damage is the primary reason why this is not just like, oh, why don't we do this or that? Neutron is brutal. So this was my presentation on basically 
nuclear shielding specifically with neutron radiation hopefully you have liked it learn from it in that case please click the like button share it amongst a friend that will help me a lot if you didn't like it didn't enjoy it i urge you to press dislike press it twice to show me extra disappointment please leave a comment because i do try to reply to all of them subscribe press the bell icon if you're free and as always thanks for watching